have um, Rob Kessler here, Chair of Art, Design and Science at the UAL, but also Professor at CSL. Um, it's quite hard to define for me what Rob's uh, practice is. In, in this way, I think it's perfect for this audience, because his work is very multi and interdisciplinary. And so there are, there are pros and cons of working across different disciplines, which I, I guess Rob could address a little bit today. But he's been um, working collaboratively with um, professionals from uh, all sorts of different <coughs> areas. Quite recently, he works with the sergeants as well. Uh, Rodney, uh, yeah. Quite an interesting yeah. one. Um, so uh, please welcome. Um, Rob. Thank you very much for coming. And, uh, Hello. Um, as Michael mentioned, um, I do a lot of collaborations. In the last 15 years, I've collaborated a lot with scientists. Uh, and there's a huge tradition of artists and designers working with scientists. But in the 19th century, it fell off. It fell away. And that's largely due to the, uh, the, the development of photography. So when photography emerged and people put cameras on microscopes, for instance, the whole of the imaging processes were put in the hands of the scientists. And so the scientists saw less and less need to work, to collaborate with artists, to kind of to show their research. Um, but that's changed in the last 20 years with the advent of digital technologies. Um, and we all share similar platforms, so that makes it a lot easier. And there are also, uh, there's also been a drive in a, from the Wellcome Trust to kind of bring on kind of collaborations for, for a variety of good reasons, which I'll talk about. Um, I, I originally studied uh, ceramics way back in the 70s at Central School of Art. Um, and I'm not quite sure, well, I know why. I couldn't, on foundation, I couldn't decide between uh, painting and, and sculpture. And, and ceramics seemed like a, an interesting alternative. Um, but I realized I'm not a mud and water man. I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't get a kick so much out of transforming a dumb lump of clay into that kind of magical object. I, but I'm much more interested in it as a cultural artifact. As I started working afterwards, after, after I graduated, I started working in other media and talking to kind of galleries. And as soon as I men mentioned the fact that I'd studied ceramics, uh, this kind of barrier came down. So it was like craft. So craft is a dirty word. So that, that was a kind of real hang-up that I had to fight through. And then I also do a lot of visualisation in the work. Uh, and I'm interested in illustration. And illustration is also a dirty word in the fine art world. And over the years, I started to reflect on that. And, and I see it in a sense as unhelpful hierarchies that are led by kind of philosophical practices within the fine arts. And whereas a fine art might see illustration or applied arts being driven by a particular medium or by a particular brief, and that is a kind of, uh, that's a limitation. I could argue the point that actually it's the opposite. It's that very kind of limitation that, starts kind of creativity. So what I want to do, I just want to start off by one or two kind of little examples uh, of what I'm talking about, and then I'm going to show a number of projects I've done over the past 15 years, and I'm going to leave those in with some historical references. Um, this is not a very good slide, sorry, it's um, from my phone. It's, it's the uh, Lady in the Unicorn part of the tapestry sequence, which is in the Cluny Museum in Paris. Um, and it's a fantastic kind of collection of tapestries. Apart from, it's a, it's a very early form of digital art. I mean, each, each knot is a pixel, in a sense. Um, but also what's interesting is it isn't just a decorative wall covering. I mean, it, it's to do with heat, so it has a kind of function. It's telling mythological stories, and it's talking about the senses, and it's depicting that in a very interesting space which extends the kind of space of the halls that they were in beyond the walls. And in some ways, those kind of flattening and opening of spaces has a lot of resonances when I kind of look at kind of Manet's De Genet sur Lèvre. But what it has also uh, is phenomenal uh, mastery of the process to convey material qualities of, of fabrics within the kind of tapestry. Uh, they're kind of stunningly uh, beautiful, actually. And they really kind of model those kind of forms. Um, I didn't show it, actually, but also flowers within there. I mean, it's at a time when the flowers move beyond kind of uh, uh, metaphorical representation to actually more accurate studies of plants. 
course, it's, I mean, this is a, it's a bit of an obvious example, but and it's also uh, not a great slide, but um, Grace and Perry's uh, Walthamstow Tapestry. In a sense, similar mythologies, current mythologies, similar processes. Um, this was a time, this is 1503, this is one of my favourite paintings, partly because it's a great painting, uh, and it's just a great title, a great piece of turf. Uh, and so Dürer is uh, looking at something which is almost insignificant, commonplace, and he's really trying to show its uh, accuracy. So, with kind of uh, really kind of high illustrational painterly qualities. Um, I mean, and he, he described himself as being an expert on process and the transformations of nature through a union of Kust and Brauch, theoretical knowledge and practical skill. So that nature, the imitation of nature produces an effect which is a work of art and displays the artisan's knowledge of nature and the science of studying that. Um, all those plants you can clearly identify if you're a, a botanist. It's not a very big painting, it's, it's quite small, but it's, uh, it's an amazing piece of work, just like all his kind of paintings. <coughs> this is a very formative, this is by Bernard Palissy, it's 14th century. This was, um, Palissy was very well known, he worked in the Tuileries, and his work fetched prices four to ten times higher than the painters of the time. And it was again, it was about replicating nature, and he developed a process of casting from nature. So they would kind of cast lizards. They cast it with a fine clay loam mixed with vinegar and urine, and they can make kind of cast life casts from that. Uh, and that was seen within that that kind of uh, new science of really kind of replicating nature. Uh, this is in the Wallace collection. Um, and I just stuck this in. This is. Uh, Joanna Vasconcelos, a Portuguese artist. So this is a piece of hers which is in the, in the City Museum in Lisbon. And she worked with uh, Bordalo Pinheiro, which is a kind of like an old Portuguese ceramic manufacturer, uh, making oversized kind of... She's kind of scaled up palacy in a way. Um, I just want to pick out one character you might not have heard of. This is uh, Venzo Jamnitza. And he was, uh, he was a goldsmith, silversmith. He was a scientific instrument maker. Uh, he was a graphic artist. Um, he went in the, and this is signified by the things that he's holding. In the background is this vase with these kind of flowers in and some of the tools that he, he designed and developed. And he wrote this book on perspective, also looking at geometric solids and re relating that to kind of development of form. A very influential book in its time. Um, and he also made pieces like this, which I think it takes time to uh, appreciate things like this sometimes, when they're over-elaborate, they're very, very ornate, very decorative. Um, and this is a, a table centrepiece, gold and silver. Um, and these are a collection of objects from that, left over from it. And these again are life casts from plants. Uh, very, very fine. You try casting bits of fern uh, now. Um, and so he was very influential in developing those processes. And the artisan at that time was seen as really being at the forefront of collaboration with science and having a greater mastery through what they could do with their hands than what the philosophers could do with describing kind of art practice. Um, this is just a very formal arrangement, but I thought it was quite nice to compare it with this, which is Karl Blossfeld's um, Art Forms in Nature, 1929. Professor of uh, Design in Berlin, Applied Arts. Um, again, he was working, these, are, I mean, these books are still in print, they still s sell and sell and sell. Uh, it's interesting that they always kind of have an audience. And he was just, again, taking commonplace roadside plants and doing these large blow-up photographs of small details. And he saw these as being uh, teaching aids for his students that were working in metal, uh, ornamental metal work, coming out of the Art Nouveau process and, and moving on. It's an aside, but um, 
uh, I'll talk a little bit later about some books I've done, but when I, when I was doing those, I remember this book from Foundation being inf very influential, and I always wanted to do something which could try and match that and, and move it on. In terms of photographic processes, these are very well-known cyanotypes, early photographic uh, prints by uh, Anna Atkins. Um, and they were developed through collaboration with Herschel, his knowledge of chemistry, and Herschel was also a friend of Fox Talbot and looking at imaging. So these are referenced a lot. I mean, cyanotypes keep going. I mean, I, I got the Tate magazine through the post this morning and there's a, there's a big blow up there of Christian Macaulay. Um, what is not often talked about is the fact that they saw these at that time as being about the democratization of knowledge so that this was a simple process, as photocopying is to us, to reproduce something in an educational kind of context. And so really important in that sense. Um, and I tried to pick out a contemporary example which wasn't Christian Macaulay, but to show some, something else which some of you might recognize by um, uh, Studio Githero, two designers, graduates from the Royal College. I work with process in a variety of media, and here they're kind of playing on the blue and white vase uh, and they're coating the vase in cyanotype liquid and then exposing their kind of plants which they'd collected round, from around the streets of London and fusing them on to these vases. Illustration. Uh, these are by uh, Arthur Harry Church who was a curator of botany in uh, the Botanic Gardens in Oxford. Um, this is uh, from 1904. Um, and he was doing a whole uh, investigation into sexual reproduction in plants. So it's quite ironic in the sense this kind of Victorian kind of uh, fascination with hidden aspects of sexuality. Um, and, but they're stunning, they're fantastic illustrations. They've got a collection of them in the Natural History Museum, if you want to go and see them. Um, and they're, they're just very stunning. A, in how they're painted, and in their uh, design. And I think it's the kind of formal arrangement of objects and artefacts across the page within kind of particularly botanical and scientific illustration, which I find really fascinating and inspiring in a way. So it was a few years before Georgia O'Keeffe, and many more years before Judy Chicago's dinner party another kind of ceramic work dealing with sexuality and, and flowers. Um, other areas of investigation being medical science. I think when I talked about the welcome, I think the welcome was very much at the forefront of, of getting artists working with scientists. Uh, I'd say the botanical world is perhaps at the back of the queue. And the reason for that is that, that medical science is it's dangerous, it's a difficult story. Um, and the pr practitioners are very keen to try and get their message across. So there was a kind of, there was a receptive audience there. Whereas botanical scientists, flowers are pretty, so you don't have to do much for me. Uh, and I think that that's why uh, there was a lot of work in the biomedical field to begin with. So this is a, a very well known image, an inaccurate image really, but uh, by Leonardo's. But again, very interesting kind of this cutaway view uh, you know, showing the face and the kind of space within the skull. And, and this, uh, this person, Santiago uh, Ramion Cajal, was, um, he was a neuroscientist. He wanted to be an artist. His father said, you can't be an artist. Uh, you have to be a doctor. Um, he was a Nobel Prize winner, and he worked on uh, neurons in the brain. Um, and this is one of his drawings. Um, and that's really a drawing to show in the form of explaining exactly what's happening inside the brain. Whereas this was a drawing to try and think about what was happening inside the brain. Um, and this is, a, this is one of his drawings, again from around about 1900. And you know, one can think of this in relation to Jackson Pollock's drawings later, and there's very expressive drawings. I think it's quite nice to compare it to this, which is uh, Henri Michaud's drawings which he did under the influence of mescaline. So 
uh, you know, his neurons, the mescaline was acting on the neurons that Cajal was kind of illustrating when he was producing these drawings, these spidery drawings. And this very kind of uh, formal, elegant work from Japan, very meticulously kind of showing the kind of skull being opened up and the, and the brain inside that. And this is a work by Catherine Dowson from 10 years ago. It was, her, it was a, from a scan of her sister's brain, I think, and she had a, a, a tumour. And this is uh, etching into glass, quite well known, well illustrated piece now. So, how about me? Um, this is a hand coloured woodcut I bought in uh, Parma, summer before last, in a, one of those shops that sells prints and and frames things. Um, and it's by Pietro Mattioli, who uh, was a well-known botanist, herbalist, il illustrator and writer on medicinal plants. And he was trying to um, upgrade the work of... Uh, no, I've kind of forgotten his name. <laughs> the Greek uh, botanist from 1500 years previous, who had developed and written a lot about de medicinal plants. And everything had been based on that. And he was trying to kind of, he and along with others at that time, trying to move the science forward. Um, it's a very beautiful kind of work, really kind of elegantly arranged. Um, and it's from a, a big book, which clearly had fallen apart, and they were selling off pages for 100 euros a shot. So, um, so I bought one. Um, but I bought that one because it was a plant that I had worked with. It's um, Ampliprasum is a wild leek. Um, and that's the that's the flower, and that's it. Uh, a few months later, dried. Um, well, these little capsules, these little um, three-sided little capsules that will have th usually three seeds inside, and these are the seeds, and these are fairly dry, so they've kind of contracted a bit. And that's the surface of the seed. <clears throat> and it has this... Uh, all plants evolve for a variety of different functions. So this, this is a kind of plated system that this family of plants will have so that as the seeds contract, um, it can, it, the surface can articulate and can move, also when it expands. Um, This is a quote from Philip Ball. Uh, Philip Ball is a, a fantastic science writer. Um, if you don't know his writing, he's written a series of books, one on flow, one on uh, branches, um, and one on shape. Um, and he just explains historical, scientific, particularly 20th century, scientific uh, developments um, in those particular areas. And he, but he explains it um, in deep science, but in a way that I can understand. Uh, I failed all my science subjects at school, so it's kind of slightly ironic that I end up kind of working with a lot of scientists. Um, and I can understand his books, which is fantastic. And he made his comment about uh, Leonardo, and he said he had to sit and stare for hours, not to see things more sharply, but, as it were, to stop seeing, to transcend the limitations of the eyes. And I suppose that struck a chord with how I work. And I, um, I do work in lots of different ways and in lots of different media. Um, and it will often start in the field. So this is a uh, wild orchid. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a have some studio out in Greece. Uh, my wife's Greek, so um, we go out there when we can. So this is uh, the space around my studio is uh, carpeted in orchids in spring. Um, so this is one of them. It's a Laxiflora, if you want to know. Um, and this is me in a very basic studio drawing. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, I was trying to do drawings of these plants, and I, and I was not very happy. I, they were a mix between you know, diagrams and illustrations, and it, it didn't seem to work. So then I started working in a different way. And I started working with Indian ink, and I was mixing aniline dyes, and the kind of dyes that they use within laboratories. Um, and I mixed the dye with the ink. Uh, and those are kind of black, those pots of black ink, they all have different dyes in. 
and I paint what is the silhouette of the, of the plant alongside me and I leave it to kind of soak into the page and it's a uh, trial and error um, and you wash it off under the tap and some of the ink washes off and some of it stays uh, and you end up with a drawing which really captures something of the essence so it takes it just takes a few minutes to do these drawings which for me is a nice contrast to some of the scientific images that I do that can take me anything up to 100, 100, 100 plus hours um, but also it, it, it seems to capture something of how I'm looking and how I feel about the plant um, and I also photograph so I do a lot of it's another it's another lens so I work with lots of lenses really uh, my own um, these, camera lenses, microscope lenses. Uh, and then the lens helps me look. It's, you know, sometimes you'll see things which you didn't see actually when you had the camera stuck right on the plant. Um, so this is another, this is an insect, it's a beetle, I'm not sure what sort. Um, it's a collaborator. And as the beetle moves around these plants, this is a kind of looking into the mouth of the flower, if you, if you go in deeper, you start to see these trichome hairs and these are these have different functions but one of the functions is as a sensory device for insects that are moving through that space um, and they know that because when they were developing some uh, hybrid plants a few years ago they found that the hybrids ha had less well developed hairs uh, and also then they found out that they, the pollinators didn't respond to them in the same way, so they were less sex successful at pollination. And if I cut a section through that, the stem of that flower, it starts to reveal the cells inside, cellular structure. So here's a, another beetle. Uh, plants are full of life, actually. Um, so this is a, an anemone. Um, so there's a drawing of that anemone and a coloured micrograph of one of the stamens from that and those little dots are pollen grains so that's one grain of pollen from that flower one of uh, several hundred thousand pollen grains um, and then if I link if I link well, backwards in time. This is a um, very well-known image from a book called Micrographia, which is 350 years old uh, this year. So there's a kind of uh, big celebrations going on. Um, it's by Robert Hooke, scientist, uh, another kind of uh, polymath. Um, and it's really an astonishing book with uh, quite amazing illustrations of anything from fleas to eyes of flies. Um, but this was particularly interesting to me because it's showing two things. It's, on the left, it's a section through uh, some wood of cork and then a, a, a frond from the same tree. So it's showing something at two orders of magnification. It's showing you something you can see and something that you, you can't see with the naked eyes. Um, and also, w when he looked at that, he described the shape of those that those sections is looking like monastic cells. So after that, those became cells. They became, that's where the word cell originated from. Um, so I was very, uh, around about the end of the 90s, I kind of, I'm not showing any of it today, but I was doing a lot of work during the 90s looking at cultural references of, of the natural world and how they migrated into our clothes or into our uh, carpets and what have you and I kind of run out of steam and I was looking to move on um, so I, I and I had a microscope which I still have a, a beautiful Victorian microscope which my father gave me when I was 10 and I was looking at some images and I just thought well no one was really working with microscopic images of plants and so I wrote into Kew Gardens uh, and it was one of those kind of magic bullet moments um, I wrote into all the different heads of the labo labs um, saying would you like to work with an artist? Um, and only one replied, and she was head of research into pollen, um, but she had a former career in, in, uh, as a, an interior designer. So she had a strong awareness of the visual 
nature of what she was, her own work. And she'd wanted to put in photograph, exhibitions of her photographs at Kew. And apart from the fact that it was felt that there wasn't enough time, you know, and her research, her scientific research was more important, it wasn't felt that scientific images would be interesting to the public. So that's what you, you see what I mean about the kind of botanical world being kind of behind. Anyway, she invited me in, and we were kind of like mutual Trojan horses, really. Um, and she showed me how to use an electron microscope. Um, an electron microscope is, is not like a conventional microscope. It's a, it's a chamber, a vacuum chamber, into which you put a specimen which is coated with gold or platinum, and it's bombarded with electron, a beam of electron particles which bounce off to a sensor and give you a phenomenal kind of um, image amazing kind of uh, resolution. Um, what was interesting, we started talking um, and there were common languages. So she would talk about ornamental surfaces uh, and sculptural uh, objects and artifacts. Artifacts. Uh, an artifact in botanical terms is a bit of crud on the surface that you would have liked to have got rid of. So that was quite an interesting uh, alternative use. Um, but also how we... I, I, I'm always a bit impatient. So I was collecting material straight from the field. So this is a um, plantain, rubber plantain. And I, I would put the pollen, prepare it, and photograph it. Whereas normally they would, they would dry it, wash it, to make sure that it was fully uh, inflated in, in its most perfect kind of form. Whereas I, I rather liked that. It was kind of collapsed. It had a very soft vessel-like quality. Um, so that immediately kind of highlighted differences in the way that we uh, both work. I did a whole series of these where I placed the kind of image of the original plant alongside the specimen which was collected from it. So these are all pollen grains. They're, they're magnified about 2,000 times, the original. So that, now that's probably about 20,000 uh, times. So we started doing a little bit of work together and then um, a number of things uh, coincided. There was um, two exhibitions. Uh, the first one was up in Edinburgh at the Botanic Garden, and it was a collection of porcelain tableware called Flora Danica, which is an 1800 piece dinner service. And each piece is hand painted with a botanical specimen. And, and these were copied from a botanical book of the same name, of which they made, I'm not sure, about eight copies. Uh, and the importance of these books was that the state gives them to other heads of state to show the prominence of their scientific kind of research and their knowledge of plants. Um, it's a phenomenal set and the painting is kind of uh, very beautiful. And then around the same time there was an exhibition at the V&A of uh, Wedgwood and I was looking at this set which was the, the frog dinner service which um, is was made for Catherine the Great of Russia. And that was at a time when French formal landscaping in landscape design was falling out of favour. And she was, she had taken on the kind of the new uh, natural romantic notions of English landscape capability Brown. So she commissioned him to make a dinner service for her palace, which was surrounded by marshes and frogs. Hence, there's a little frog at the top of each plate. But Wedgwood is... Um, again, another kind of polymath character. I mean, he was a, an ardent anti-slavery uh, champion. He was very instrumental in the development of the canals, so that when, he, when they built the canals and they shipped his China by canal, his, his loss rate dropped by 70%, because before they were taken by road, and most of it used to break. Um, but also he was a technologist, and he was very canny. So he, he, are, he employed a number of artists to kind of draw landscapes from important sites around the UK and stately homes. Um, and then he employed engravers to, to translate those into print for this 800-piece service. And then before he sit, shipped it to, the, to Russia, he hired a space in Regent Street and he put on a show and he invited the, kind of, uh, the patrons of the stately homes uh, and he sold a lot more versions of that and got more commissions. So he was, he was a very kind of pioneering entrepreneur as well. So this, this fired my imagination. And um, 
up until I got this post recently, I've, I've still been professor of ceramics at Central for a long time, and I was always there half time. And ceramics was always part of what I did. Um, and I noticed an advert for residences at Grisdale Forest, and I'd applied for residences in forests before, uh, but I don't think they were quite ready for me. Um, and I'd been up to Grisdale the year before, and we'd gone through, and I, it was really disappointing. Most of the work was, I'd call it kind of sub-log art. I mean, it was the, the earlier days of, of Nash and uh, Goldsworthy doing work up there, which was much more pioneering, uh, had, had just been kind of copied and, and uh, illustrated, if you like. And I just thought there were other opportunities. So an advert just came out, there was a new director, as it turned out, and he put out for new projects. So I proposed that I would develop a dinner service based on specimens that I would collect in the forest. Um, and the new, the new director happened to be a kind of big foodie as well. So he kind of... Uh, and he'd done a project with Richard Slee before up in Inverness. So he was receptive to kind of other approaches to working. So Grisdale Forest, if you don't know, it's in the middle of the Lake District. Um, it's a very beautiful space. That's Lake Coniston in the background. Um, and that's me collecting pollen from flowers. And that's when I first started experimenting with that drawing process. So I was doing these quick ink drawings of the flowers in the fields. Um, and I developed this, this kind of range of tableware. Uh, and each is decorated with grains of pollen, printed in enamel and with gold, and a fragment of text. And the text comes from um, a, the uh, original manuscript of Praeterita, which is by John Ruskin. He's talking about wayside flowers. Uh, and John Ruskin's house, John Ruskin, the Victorian writer, artist, philosopher, historian, uh, his house was underneath, where I, at the foot of the hill where I was working. And so I think that's one thing as an artist, uh, you, you have a license to push doors open. So through that, I was able to have complete access to all his archives. So I developed a whole dinner service. It was quite, quite restrained, quite um, elegant. It is a common flower, it says. Um, and clearly, it's not the kind of thing you're going to leave out in the in the forest. So we organised uh, a, a little banquet for 12 people on top of the fells. Um, and there were 12 place settings, and each place setting was for a particular flower. And the placemat had botanical information, scientific information about the flower which the pollen came from. Uh, the napkins had a kind of print on from my drawings, and everyone had to bring something. Um, they had to contribute. So there was, um, there was a food historian. I mean, she was a food historian, big, um, venison farmer and jeweller uh, and so she developed a menu from which all the food came from the forest so we had two types of venison we had arctic char from the lake we had wild greens we had wood pigeon um, there was the director of the wordsworth trust who kind of gave a reading of wordsworth's poems on daffodils there was a herbalist a local beekeeper um, and in a sense what i um but I, what I came to realise through doing this project that the kind of the nature of the object that I make shifts from being a, an, an object which might be in an exhibition to an object which is used. And when it's used, it's kind of used as a conduit, in this case, of bringing people together who didn't know each other. Uh, and it's a way of me interacting with a very small audience. Um, and what was very good about that, the one person I invited was the, the then Ruskin scholar, uh, in Oxford, um, and I didn't know him. I phoned him up, and he was very keen to come. He came. Uh, he walked up in a Victorian frock coat from uh, Ruskin's house up the hill. Um, but he had been an advisor to Nesta, which is the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts. And um, as, a, as through doing that, he'd been asked to. He'd been gifted two two fellowships to propose. So he asked me he, after a couple of months later, he phoned me up and asked me if I was interested in a large sum of money and I got given pretty much given three years funding to continue the work at Kew which meant it brought me out of some of the teaching I was doing too much and then I could really go more deeply so these are images which came from this time of, of pollen uh, seeds, this is from a marigold uh, this is a hibiscus um, they are 
the diversity of structures is uh, quite astonishing. Um, and I've made it a point to do all my own lab work whenever I possibly can. N not all the specimens are mine. Uh, I mean, I get to travel around Europe mainly, uh, but my co-colleagues at Kew uh, tend to travel further afield to kind of Australia and South Africa. Um, this is a balloon seed. Um, but one of, the, one of the things about going more deeply and having to try and meet the scientists on their ground and understand their science um, is to know more about it. So last year, about 12 months ago, the v and did a biomimicry day. And the person I was speaking, the person speaking before me was an um, industrial designer from Germany. And he was showing different influences and talking about them. And he showed this image. And they didn't know it was mine, so that was quite fun. And he said, of course, this has evolved like this to protect the seed inside. It's a kind of packaging. Um, and actually, I'm, I might have made that assumption as well. But that's not what it's for. It's actually to give it a bigger wind profile, a bigger wind footprint, if you like, for the minimum amount of weight. So it carries further on the wind. I mean, OK, maybe there's some protection in there as well, but it's very, very fragile. Um, so knowing about the subject, um, for me, is really important. This is willow. Um, and this is a uh, scabious from the Greek mountains. Now, uh, there's a question uh, which is often asked, and that is, um, it's about the colour. And is this the original colour? Uh, and uh, no, it's not. Because most of the time, um, the, uh, the images you get on SEM up until recently have been black and white. So I add the colour. But the, the response when I said it's not the real colour, particularly from scientific audiences, are, oh, well, it's false colour. And false colour is a term that they will use. They colour their images up to make them look more attractive or for a variety of other reasons. Um, and they call that false colour. And I started to object to that because it implied that uh, I had very little to do with the coloration process. Whereas in actual fact, um, there's a lot, there's, there's hours and hours goes into uh, using one basic process, which is Photoshop, but many, many layers of different color and working through with the same kind of sensitivity that I might if I'm using watercolor or pastel drawings in the past. And I'll use the color based on the original plant colour of the flower. I'll use it to kind of pick out different functional characteristics. I'll model it to make sure I bring out its kind of really three-dimensionality. Sometimes they can be quite flat in black and white. And then I'll also use the colour intuitively in response to the specimen. Um, and this was a very kind of Izumaki kind of silk fabric kind of balletic pose. And what's interesting, when the, when the botanist would show one of these specimens in a journal, they would have that image the other way up. Um, and in the book that we did on seeds, I had a similar seed, which was the other way up. But when I was doing it, I turned it over, and to me, it made much more sense that it was this way up. So that's my role as, as an artist. And then I, I realized, actually, the scientists meddle with their images all the time to make them the way that they want to put across the message that, that they're trying to show, um, whether it's from the Hubble telescope to pollen grains. So there's a lot of mediation. Um, so this is also outside my studio. This is a single uh, ant of the round table. It's an ant carrying a huge seed. And on the left, it's, it's the seed, it's, it's the ant's refuse tip. So those are all seed cases. So they're technically fruits, the seed inside. Um, and I just wanted to show you, so that's a seed from that collection there. And I just thought I'd show you kind of something of the process doing these. So this is a seed, it's a medicargo seed, medic, which is about 43 types in the kind of family. And it's probably about, mm, about three to four millimetres across. And in this state, I've coated it with uh, platinum. And then I'll photograph it. Because it's too big to go in, I can't, you know, if you photograph pollen, you can get thousands on one image. But with, with a big seed like this, you can only get part of it. So, um, Let's see if it's going to work. So I take multiple frames. Um, and it's a kind of reconstructive surgery. Um, 
they don't all fit together as well as it might look there. There's a lot of juggling around. Um, and sometimes you might find that one of the tips has been broken up, broken off. Uh, and I'll repair that. I'll repair it with a, one from another part of the plant or another plant. And then start to add the colour and bring the colour up. Until I arrive at the kind of final solution. And these images are about um, actual size, about a metre across. Um, at a high resolution, about 512 dpi. And um, they are, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the good thing about scanning electron microscopes, you get phenomenal resolution. So these are Medicargo, other versions, other in the same family. This is orbicularis, no, it's, that's orbicularis. So some of them are spiny, some of them are smooth. But they all apply to, the, they all have this kind of convention, this spiral un, unwinding. Um, and as you might guess, it's kind of related a bit to the pea family, so it's a bit like a pea pod which has been wrapped up. Uh, hopping back to, to Ruskin, this was from a book of his, he had dried flower specimens from the Alps. Um, so the Victorian grand tour of leaving kind of London, travelling through France over the Alps to Italy, and these are the flowers that he collected. And I, I do a similar journey every year when I go to Greece, but I do it in uh, a rather old Volvo, um, passing plants en route. Uh, and I collect specimens en route as well, but I do it, uh, this is doing it the lazy way, so this is the pollen filter from the car. Uh, and this is, a, this is one pollen grain stuck to the fibres uh, of the filter. Um, and it's pollen grain from pine. Um, certain pollen grains you can identify with uh, absolute clarity, because um, there's such kind of characteristic forms. Others you can hazard a guess. So I know that's the kind of a kind of dandelion family, but exactly which one I don't know. Um, that's a mallow family, and uh, I'm not sure could be pea. And these are all pollen grains, and the purpose of the filter is to uh, well filter out any unwanted debris. Uh, aeroallergens coming into the car. So I use those, uh, oh, set that. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it's um, very beautiful. Um, and I use it for a project I was invited to take part in. A, it was a kind of three evening uh, sound event at the Botanic Gardens in Oxford. Um, and I made a piece of work based on this tree, which is a Davidia, which is common name is handkerchief tree because the, the flower is the kind of little red ball and it has these white bracts which hang down and they look just like soft white handkerchiefs. So I, I printed these uh, images from my pollen filter onto silk. So I had these silk-like handkerchiefs hanging from the tree. And then... Oh, I don't know if you can hear that. Um, this is in Greece, uh, where a good friend has about 50 beehives. So I went out with her when she was collecting honey one day. First I was immediately struck by the fact that the, her collection of honey is a similar kind of frame mechanism to my pollen filter. Um, and I'm recording the sound of the bees, which is what is sort of going on in the background here. And I bought a beehive back. Uh, which I installed in the tree and just lit up at night um, so that the sound drew people to it. And that was another way of me kind of meeting audiences. Um, there was another person working on uh, bats, picking up ultrasound, ultrasonic uh, sounds from bats. So it was a kind of journey of discovery for, for the audiences and meeting the kind of people that were producing those sounds. Um, Insects are interesting. I mean, this was in an email, I think I got a couple of days ago for the London Art Fair. I don't have to tell you whose work it is. Um, but people have been doing strange things with butterflies for a, quite a long time. And this is, I didn't know this person, I just came across it recently, um, Horace Waller. It's Lepido Lepidochromy. And it's from a book, which, again, I think it's in the Natural History Museum. And, and they produced a series of books in which they had actual butterflies, and they printed a, they printed an adhesive varnish onto the page, and they pressed the butterfly wing onto the page, 
and it lifted and lifted off what was left, and it left all the scales. Uh, but they couldn't have the body, so they painted the body in the middle. So it's a very curious. I mean, there weren't many copies of the book, as you can imagine. It's rather, it's not very good for the butterflies, and it's, uh, it takes rather a long time to do as well. Um, but I think places like the Natural History Museum are stuffed with uh, material like this that you hardly ever get to see. Um, so this is a, an image. I did an event last year, uh, last year, last November at Central St Martin's. I may do something similar next year, which was looking at pattern. And uh, I, I had a lot of microscopes in the in the gallery, and I persuaded um, an English supplier of electron microscopes, and they had a desktop electron microscope. Um, normally, electron microscopes are about three to four hundred thousand um, pounds, plus your kind of seven thousand, ten thousand pound a year service charges. Um, but this was a desktop version, and it was uh, ninety thousand pounds worth. So they agreed to bring it in for the week. Um, this is a photograph of a um, with just an ordinary camera inside the chamber. So you find out where the specimen is, and it's a butterfly wing, uh, the bicyclos butterfly. It's um, it, this is this butterfly is to butterfly studies what the wild type mouse is to uh, people who work on mice. It's, it, it's very very reliable. Um, and so butterfly spots are very interesting. The Philip Ball book I mentioned explains how butterfly spots uh, originate. I'm not going to attempt to do that now because I'll probably get it partly wrong. But there's not really time. But, um, this is a butterfly wing photographed on this uh, machine. Um, and uh, butterfly wings are made up of thousands of scales, just like kind of shingle roof tiles. And that kind of disturbance in the centre is where the eye spot is. Um, that's an earlier image of mine where I've artif artificially coloured it up to kind of show where the spot is. But you can really see the disturbance. And you see these kind of darker lines coming around down, which are the ribs in the butterfly wings, so where the scales kind of ruckle up, almost like ridge tiles on a roof, to give it kind of strength in those areas. And if you look more closely at the butterfly wing, it's full of these little cells, chambers. And it is the re it's the way that the light is bounced around inside each of those chambers that causes the, the uh, refraction of the light to give it its luminescence and its, its individual colour. I mean, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very humbling <laughs> to understand that that's how it works, and at such a tiny scale. Uh, and if I if I go back, that how big is that one? That's magnified. That's magnified about 370 times. So I'm not sure. Oops. Yeah, I'm not sure what that. What, that's probably probably about 2,000 again. Um, there's a lot of research going into how this works, funded by the cosmetics industry. That's another relationship between money and science. Um, just a couple of illustrations. Uh, Maria Sibylla Marian. Marian. Um, again, another of those kind of intrepid explorers who took a ten-year-old ten-year-old daughter out travelling. Um, this is from a whole series from Suriname. And again, it's this thing of trying to put different aspects of life within one image. So you have the butterfly, you have the pupa, you have the caterpillar, and you have the plants that they kind of feed off. Uh, kind of very exotic. It's a collection of uh, about 90 drawings. Um, you can find these online. British Museum have a huge collection, actually, um, which you can download for educational purposes. Uh, but, they're, but they are very beautifully painted. Um, and this in contrast, this is Cornelia Hess Honegger, who's a contemporary, trained as a, um, a scientific illustrator. Um, but she's rather frowned upon by the scientific illustrator uh, population because she's distorting facts. In a sense, she's, she's, she's not showing perfect specimens. She's showing deformed specimens that are deformed through a result of radiation. So this one's from Three Mile Island. She's got material from, uh, from uh, what was it, in Russia, in Chernobyl. Thank you. Um, so she's meticulously recording 
what happens when things go wrong. Um, this is a uh, little tree, fig tree in Q. Quite small figs, size of um, a big pea, I'd say. Um, when you cut it in half, this is what you see. And so figs, in case you didn't know, fig is a, it's an enclosed inflorescence. So inside here, those kind of red parts are the stamens of the inflorescence, of the flower, as it were, with the pollen grains inside that. So you need the pollinator to, to pollinate the fig. And that pollinator is the fig wasp. And it's tiny. It's really it's a small speck. And the fig wasps bury themselves. They drill through. They, they, they go up through the aperture at the end of the fig. Uh, they consume nectar, whatever it is they're taking from it, proteins and sugars, and then they mate, um, as a result of which the male dies, and the female burrows her way out to fly off to the next fig. So you do eat dead male wasps when you're eating figs. You probably haven't noticed, but next time you eat a fig, I'm sure you'll look more closely. Um, but when you're looking, um, we know that's what they go in there for, because that, those are the pollen grains that were caught on its thorax. Um, we hadn't gone in to kind of illustrate that, we just happened to, I happened to spot it um, when I was doing the work. Um, glass is another medium that I work with, and these kind of well known kind of glass pieces by the Blaschka brothers, um, who were really making, they had their own kind of glass factory making uh, decorative, uh, decorative glass ware, but they developed uh, a branch of their business which was making objects, scientific objects, for reference. And they were largely uh, sea life and plants. And they are staggeringly accurate in their representation. Um, most of the plant ones are in, I think they're in Yale. Um, they do have some in the Natural History Museum, but they even did kind of small, small plankton, which they kind of enlarged, but really um, very beautiful. And glass is uh, very beautiful. Um, so here's my uh, riverwork pollen grain. And when I was on the Nestor Fellowship, I treated myself to a weekend um, at West Dean, and I went on a glass engraving course. Um, and I like the idea of drawing onto glass which is really difficult. <laughs> um, if you see a skilled glass engraver, um, it's quite staggering. Uh, it takes a lot, a lot of practice. Not all of what they do is uh, my cup of tea. Um, but actually, it, I mean, in technical terms, it's quite staggering. So I, I, I was interested in that. And having been up at Oxford, I was in conversation with them about their greenhouses. Um, when I was doing the, the other project. And they had a problem. And the problem was that Oxford water is some of the hardest water uh, in the country. And inside, if anyone's been, there's a kind of corridor which goes through the inside of the greenhouse. Um, and the glass was completely calcified from 40 years of hard water, and you couldn't see through. And they, in one small corner, they'd changed the glass. It looked fantastic, but they didn't have a budget for changing the rest of it. So we discussed the idea of doing it as a project um, and trying to get funding. We applied to various places and didn't come up. In the end, we got the funding. And what interested me was how to do something which was not too intrusive. I mean, I think it's quite, it's very hard doing public projects. I've done a few. I'm not always happy with what I've done, in a way. I think it's a particular skill. Um, and I like, this was, a, this was on a skiing trip, <laughs> going up in a, a lift and just looking at the ice patterns that were forming, which were there, and, and seeing them melt as actually, I think we were coming down, as, they were, as we were coming down into kind of warmer territory. I had this idea of, of etching onto the glass. So I collected botanical specimens from the gardens and, and around Oxfordshire, um, which I etched onto the glass, and we changed the whole of the glass all the way through. So it's, uh, I don't know, about four, 400 separate panes of glass, all into old aluminium frames, which each, each piece was a different size and shape. Quite challenging uh, installation job. Um, 
But again, what we're doing, I'm looking at the same object, you know, we're looking at different or, uh, orders of magnification. Um, it completely transformed the space, it completely opened it up. So in that sense, it's had a, another function which um, we couldn't have anticipated. The, the garden staff that worked there really loved it because it was showing them things which they hadn't really seen. It still gets condensation and sometimes it's all wet and you can't see anything and then it dries out and they suddenly reappear again. So I think it's kind of one of the more successful public projects I've done. Um, and it's sort of maintenance free which is nice. Uh, and that's still there. Um, this is uh, another project. Attitudes, I mean, I've been berating the kind of art world for its attitudes towards uh, illustration and applied arts. But actually, um, those territories don't always help themselves. Uh, and the, particularly within scientific illustration, there are a lot of very unhelpful attitudes about what you should and shouldn't do and what's allowed and what counts. Um, and this is a uh, German school uh, kind of wall chart of a plant section. Is it 18? So sort of around 1900 perhaps. Um, and these were pulled out of a skip that had been thrown out of a kind of uh, a botanical school uh, in the States because they were deemed, they were, it's not, you know, that's the past. Um, so they were retrieved by. Um, there's a big uh, collection of botanical illustrations in the institute which is linked to Carnegie Mellon University where I was doing some teaching. Um, so we discussed the idea of me doing a kind of a show mixing my images with theirs. Um, and the kind of images I'll show relate to those. And So this is three years ago, four years ago, um, I had a fellowship uh, at the Gulbenkian Science Institute in Lis just outside of Lisbon. Uh, and it was a kind of dream ticket. Uh, I had five months plus an apartment overlooking kind of Lisbon. Um, and uh, they said I could do whatever I wanted. I could go work, you know, work with whoever I wanted. It's one of those kind of rare occasions. And so that's the lab I worked in, the plant science lab. And I, again, I was working with simple plant specimens. And I wanted to use some other kinds of microscope, but it was very competitive to get on the machines. And I needed more time. So I just used a very basic machine very basic microscope to look at plant sections. And whereas with the, the scanning images, I'm colouring those post-production, as it were. Here, you take a specimen, you cut, you take a, a plant, and you use an old-fashioned razor blade, and you slice through as fine as you can possibly get, about half a millimetre, if you do that. And it has to be kind of flat, um, not sort of not wedge-shaped. Um, so... I'm not sure what those are from. I'm just going back. You can see on the table some stains there, the blue stain. Um, and you, what's what's kind of amazing is that you you put the specimen into the stain, and the stain responds to the different proteins, sugars in the plant, and it responds to different parts of that section in different ways. So the epidermis with this particular stain often comes out purple, um, and you can see. The, uh, all these little green spots, the chlorophyll, chloroplast. And this is from a uh, Naples garlic, it's the stem from Naples garlic. And this is made up of about, I don't know, about 60 images, I think, 60 frames pieced, pieced together. The, the dark purple spots, which are quite hard to see, those are the vascular cells. So those are the cells that are carrying kind of, uh, the genetic information through the plant. Um, and the, chlorof the chlorophyll is providing the sugar for the plant to live off. And this is from uh, another type of orchid. This is made up of about 600, 600 separate images. So it was a similar process. The, the scientists there, if they wanted to show a whole specimen, they would photograph it at a low magnification and to print that size in a publication. No problem. I, I want to show this size. Um, so if you blow up one of those, it's just completely, you know, it's a very, very low-grade image. So what I would do, I would photograph a very small section in a stack, and then I would, I would remove the bits that were out of focus. I'd do different depths of field, compress it, 
And then I would move on. And then I'd do that again and again. Um, and what was interesting is that they would never do that in there. Um, they don't have the time. Actually, they don't have the, the need. Um, but what it did do, they'd never seen their kind of specimens in quite this way before. So I could produce, again, really high resolution uh, images, uh, which kind of shocked them. Um, and the good thing about that is, and the good thing about doing it myself, is that uh, you get a lot more respect. Um, so it means that you know, my, the images that I do, I find them in labs around the world now. Um, and part of the thing I did at Kew um, for the Nesta Fellowship, my, my manager at that time on the fellowship, he gave me, challenged me to get a book deal together. He heard me talking about doing a book. He said, I'll give you six months to get a book deal together. And it's just the kind of thing you need sometimes. And so I'd, I'd always done artist books in the past, from small photocopied up to kind of hand-stitched you know, editions of 50, uh, which, as you know, you only sell five. Anyway, um, uh, and so, yeah, I put a book together. We went cold calling to the book fair at, at, at Earl's Court, and we showed them Thames and Hudson, Fyden, and they all went, whoa, these are amazing images. But who's going to buy it? Where do you put it in the bookshop? Is it, you know, is it, you know, is it plants? Is it photography? No, there's no market. And we said, but actually, we think lots of people would like these images. In the end, we found one small publisher who had published on architecture, and so they said, well, okay, well, give it a go, and you might, you won't make any money. He said, you won't sell very many, but and we started working on the book. Q weren't interested. Um, anyway, it turned out it was a 240-page book uh, in full colour. Um, and it was a full scientific text about pollen, um, in which there were mainly my images, some of Madeline's. Um, I wrote a kind of piece also about botanical illustration and plants and photography. Um, and it, it started selling through word of mouth. So beekeepers were the first people to buy it, and kind of botanists, and then kind of jewellers, and then, and it kind of spread. Um, and uh, I know that Thames and Hudson have tried to... <laughs> it's been on their tables, and Dorling Kindersley, and they've thought about trying to reproduce something similar, but actually it's very hard. It's a lot, a lot of work. But having done that, we did pollen, one on seeds and one on fruit, and another one which is a combination of all those, which are now in eight languages. We've sold about 160,000 copies around the world. So that's one of my... Whereas a plant will need insects to... Uh, pass on the seed, plant it somewhere else, pass on the pollen, the pollinator. I use different vectors, so I'm using the internet and I'm using the publishing. So these are still kind of marigold stems uh, and the primrose. That's one hair on the stem. So next time, one thing, buy yourself a magnifying glass, eight times magnifying glass, fantastic. Actually. Uh, you see the world differently. Um, this is inside the uh, French embassy, uh, or French consul, in Lisbon. I mean, I just got, I'd, I'd, I'd heard it had got this ceramics collection, and it's got this bizarre room with this uh, pyramidal shaped ceiling, um, which uh, it's, like the, it's like the potter's uh, stairway to heaven, really. So it's all 17th century kind of Portuguese ceramics. So. Um, and surrounded by these tiles. It's fantastic. It survived uh, earthquakes. Um, it's fantastic. So that kind of triggered me what to do with the images I was doing in Portugal. And I worked with uh, Vista Alegre, who is very well, it's the kind of Wedgwood of Portugal, really, a very old porcelain factory. Um, and they have very good, they have their own in house printing facilities. And so you get really good colour rendition. Um, and I worked with some of their blanks. So I've worked a lot with blank white. China or porcelain. It's the current of my piece of paper in ceramic. It's the blank start. And they had these, this range which hadn't sold very well um, and it was a slightly odd shape. It wasn't circular. It was kind of cellular shaped. And I made uh, one piece of work using those for, um, for the lobby of the oops, sorry, uh, of the, of the Gulbenkian Foundation and it was, on, it was for the occasion of a kind of a three-day conference on the role of image in science and art. Um, and it's just sitting on this, this big print of one of, the, one of the plant specimens. 
So in this context, it was working as, a, as an art object, if you like, slightly curious. And I suppose I always work in a territory which is slightly one step removed from the norm, in a way, um, so that people never quite know what to make of things. Um, but also, they are plates, so you can use them. So I took advantage of um, the uh, British Council, have a very beautiful ballroom. I've been to an event there, so I, I persuaded them to let me do something in there. And again, I used the plates um, as a way to bring people together. And it, it, was a coming, it was a culmination of the project out there in my five months. So I invited politicians, the science minister, uh, curators, director of museums, journalists, press, some of the scientists, some of the artists, just to bring them together to meet, maybe to kind of forge some uh, connections, maybe not. Um, but it's the point at which people come together and go away again. And I collaborated with a, uh, a food lab out there. It was a kind of Portuguese Heston Blumenthal. And the following year, they, they, they asked me back, there was an event, International Plant Fascination Day, great title. Um, um, and the Gorbank had asked, been asked to put something on in, in a building nearby. It was an agricultural research centre, which was now virtually empty and not being used. And this was the boardroom, this fantastic table, which was covered with old microscopes. Um, and this beautiful kind of uh, 19... I think it's uh, 50s mural up on the, on the end wall. Um, and I, one of the series of plates, I'd cut a hole through so the plate became a vase. So you could display uh, the artifact uh, and, and its source. Um, and finally, this is a project I did this time last year. This is uh, Forty Hall, which is a Jacobean mansion in Enfield. If you drive up the A11 uh, through the kind of wastelands of uh, IKEA and uh, industrial kind of developments, turn off, and this is kind of wonderful parkland. Um, and I was asked if I would do a show up there. And when I started to research about it, it was built by. Um, it's Nicholas Rainton, who was the Lord Mayor of London at that time, and he was a draper um, and an importer of, of fabrics and silks. So, ah, silks, so that's made me start to think. But then I found out that it was built in the same year as this person was born, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, who was the inventor of the first, really what's thought to be the first microscope. This is only about uh, three or four centimetres long. Um, and Leeuwenhoek was also uh, a silk merchant, and he developed it to, to really to kind of look at his silks, but then he started looking at plants. So there was a nice synergy um, about that relationship. So then I developed... Oh, that's one of his, one of his drawings. Um, how on earth he managed to see that through that microscope, I... I, can I, that? I, I don't know. I mean... The little hole has a tiny bead of glass and you put the specimen on the point which you can kind of move up and down and in and out a little bit. Um, so how we saw that, but you couldn't have seen it any other <laughs> way. Um, so this is, uh, this is a specimen of wood, this is an electron micrograph of some mulberry wood uh, from the mulberry tree in Forty Hall in the grounds. Mulberry being where the silk moss, moth resides. And so I did a series of pieces to go around. So in the dining room, I created this table setting. Actually, it's the wrong slide, but there should be more pieces in it than that, in this glassware. But um, it's a silk tablecloth um, with a portrait of itself. So it's a magnified version of the material it's, uh, that it's made of. And on that, there are printed pollen grains collected from flowers in the garden which then appeared as prints in another part of the, the hall. And on the plates, the kind of wood sections and details from the leaves of the mulberry tree. And as you move around from one... Oh, there we go. That's a mulberry pollen and the hairs on the back of a mulberry leaf. 
And as you move around, I just use different spaces. So uh, I printed up these plant sections that I had from Portugal onto Habitai silk, Japanese silk, which is very light. And they're digital prints. And Habitai silk is great because it, the color penetrates all the way through. Um, and has a has a very beautiful kind of soft motion. Um, that's a section through uh, moss, marigold. What was in, what's inter interesting about the house is that it doesn't have lots of furniture in. It's used for amenities. Sometimes they might use it for weddings. So uh, they use it for education things, and they can do dressing up. So it's quite open. But what I was using were the kind of original hanging systems, which would have had. Uh, hangings on the walls in the first place. So, um, you know, going right back to uh, where I started at the beginning, in a sense. So each room was a different discovery. It's a fantastic. If ever you're up that way, it's really worth uh, a visit. So each room is just like a little mini gallery, and I, I don't do, I don't really do very many white cube type spaces. I really like to work with um, somewhere that has already got some historical or history to it that I interact with, which is again why maybe clay as a dumb lump didn't really suit me. Um, and this room, this is again, this is uh, this is still up there. They kept it up. They they liked it so much. Um, and this is, again, it's moss, sphagnum moss. Each of those cells is a kind of chamber which retains the water, which is why moss is so spongy. Um, on the mantelpiece, I had some petri dish dishes with moss collected from around the house, from outside in the garden, which is kept alive. And this kind of glass vessel. Moss grain. And again, um, we use the table for an event. This is a film session going on. Um, so currently there's an exhibition which opened on Monday night at, in the Lethbridge Gallery at Central St. Martins. Um, and it's called Lens on Life. It's on until the 27th of February. Uh, and this is um, uh, artists and scientists meeting to, just, to talk and be filmed and to eat. Um, and sometimes one of the questions, I don't get asked it quite so much anymore, a question in the past might be what's in it for the scientist in these kind of collaborations. You know, we can see why the artists want to go there. Well, in this particular case, what's in it for the scientist is they wouldn't have got their funding for their research had it not been for the artists. Because they'd had previous funding. Um, and they're researching mitosis. Um, and mitosis is cell division. And this is one human egg prior to being fertilized. It's a film of, of one egg. And they'd had funding in the past, and this time they applied. This is five years ago, actually. And they didn't get it. So uh, one of the scientists, who's a top geneticist in Oxford, um, had worked on a project I was involved in in Vienna some years before. And so the way these kind of th things work through networks, Curator was brought in to develop a project in which there was myself, uh, Lucy Orta, Ackroyd and Harvey, and Shobana Joe Singh, who's a choreographer. We were each paired up with uh, a scientist. Um, and we were filmed meeting the scientist in their lab, and then we went away and produced some work, and the scientist came to our studio. And then we went away and did some more work, and then we all met up over the meal to describe what we were doing. And the results are what are on show now at the Lethby Gallery. Um, and as a result of that resubmission, the scientists got their 10 million euro funding, um, of which the artists got a small amount to make the work. But, um, but it's a, uh, being able to enter other people's kind of practice is a real privilege. Um, and uh, to get to talk to some kind of top scientists, they see things very differently. They were very skeptical. They thought we were going to just... Um, uh, do, a, do a kind of a public relations exercise or illustrate what they do. So they were quite surprised when they first saw us and because that's not what we've done. And we responded in different ways. Um, so that's on, that's on, on now. I, I'm going to probably do a couple of lunchtime talks there. So that will go up um, on the 
postgraduate newsletter that Rachel sends, Rachel Daniel sends around. And those are the, some of the people that I've uh, worked with. Uh, when you go to, uh, if, if you're working with scientists and they're giving presentations, they, they are totally reliant on funding, more so than we are. Um, they cannot do their work without funding. I mean, they, there aren't many back, you know, garden shed scientists. Um, and they need a lot of money. Um, and it's getting increasingly competitive for them. Um, but consequently, when they give a talk, they're very, uh, very aware of crediting who has provided the money and who they work with. Um, and actually, uh, artists and designers, uh, they're getting a little bit better, but often don't uh, credit. Uh, so actually, uh, yeah, so those are some of the scientists and some of the funders that I've, that's made it all possible. That's quite long, sorry. It's meant to be less than that, but it's hard to put it in. The other thing is, if, if, you, if you give a presentation to a science audience, uh, you get bombarded with questions. And not only that, I've heard, when I was in Portugal, what was really interesting is that twice a week, they would do a lunchtime seminar. And Tuesday, it was an internal researcher. And everyone has to do it uh, throughout the year. And they're presenting to their colleagues. And they're all, it's all different. You know, they all have a basic, they have a baseline knowledge of, of science, molecular biology. And then they've got their own specialisms, whether it's genetic or behavioural. So it's about informing practice. And on a Friday, they'd fly someone in, you know, from America or Australia to give a one-hour seminar. But those seminars, uh, because science is proof-based, they ask questions. And they'll say, you can't say that. <laughs> How can you prove that? Are you sure about that? And their questions are much more demanding than I've ever seen in any kind of uh, audience in the UK for an art and design event. Um, we've got much more polite. Did you have to do any of those presentations? I did. I'd, uh, and the person who uh, was my host, the botanist there, he was slightly concerned that, first of all, no one would turn up. Um, and actually, in fact, lots of people turned up. And then you are asked questions. So they said, um, what's your definition of art? <laughs> I don't have a definition of art. So they say, well, what do you tell your students when they ask me? I said, well, they don't ask that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's your definition of science? And that kind of stopped a bit. And so I did actually kind of work up a definition of art using kind of science terminology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say this, so that art is a practice of looking at the world through a series of filters, um, transcriptive filters. Um, and I'll change those filters to observe how that affects what it is that I'm looking at. And then there are, there are a number of modifiers, and those modifiers can be um, where I might show the work or who's writing about it. So I kind of, I, I, that's how I kind of catched it that, that way. So yeah. in the way that, that that actual dialogue with the scientists has given you a different perspective, a different view on your own work? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think for quite some time, my, these kind of images but they're very well received in the science world because they can clearly see what it is and it's different to what they do and they understand how difficult it is to do and, and they can't or don't have the time to do that. Whereas, and that's based on the knowledge of knowing what that is. You know, they, they would know that those yellow things that on there are not grains of pollen, uh, but they're actually um, uh, bacterial kind of spores. Whereas if I'm kind of looking to audio audiences, they're much less informed about science practice and what you're looking at. So how do you judge it? So uh, I think that is a, it's a very difficult territory. I think it, increasingly, as, as material kind of seeps out and it gets better known, people start to accept it then for what it is. But uh, the, my images are quite different to the scientists' images. You know, if, you go past the, if you go past the window of the Wellcome Trust, there are some you know, science images they've got in the window, images of the year. Uh, uh, and then they're not as good as my images. Uh, and that might sound uh, uh, for them to say, but 
because they, they don't they're just using a push button technology There's, they're more basic kind of images sometimes they can be very spectacular um, what their status is uh, is quite different so what my status as an artist is about transforming it in a very uh, particular very kind of subtle way um, yeah it's an interesting but is, 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 is your vision in this area being defined by the kind of increasing scientific knowledge you've developed around kind of plants I think and botany like if, for example could you translate this into into uh, space images um, sometimes it, one of the one of the questions I uh, people say, "Oh, you're going to make that? You, know, you can make that." Sorry, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's just like copying my own images. I do do it as a student project. So the first year ceramics at CSM, I give them black and white version of these without saying what it is. So, okay, make that in the round, 50 centimeters, and it's a really interesting kind of challenge. People say, oh, oh. I, "I get I get approached sometimes by filmmakers, TV particularly." Uh, can we get, I want to you know, come into the microscope and fly down and you know, um, and that technology is advancing um, but I, I can't I can't I'm not an animator I mean there's a limit to how many different things I can learn so there is a film which comes out this year called uh, Seeds of Time which if you get a chance to see it it's a fantastic film it's um, to my shame I always forget the name of the, the person it's about it, um, it's about the man who was the inspiration behind the seed bank in Norway, which is built into the mountain, which is looking at grain seeds. And, and his life and his journey are inspiring people around the world. Uh, it's a really be it's a, it's a beautifully made film. It's very moving. Um, it's part history, part contemporary. But the title sequence are my images flying across the screen. So they worked with an animator from my images to do that. And it's not bad, actually. It's pretty good. Um, so that's it. And that's that's one way. Um, can I transfer it? Uh, it it's quite it, each technology requires um, new skills. For if if I, oh, I can't do that. If I if I were to go back to um, uh, oh, doesn't, oh, I can't do it. If I could go back to that image that was moving, that's a confocal micro, mic, microscopic image. Um, and to do that, they stain it with uh, fluorescing proteins, um, which are originally based from kind of jellyfish and they'll kind of glow in the dark, basically. And different parts, so the red, the nucleus will come up red, different other parts, uh, different kind of plasma parts will come up green, and they and they can they can make a 3D animation of that. They can, as you can see, that film. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it's not as intuitive as some of the other processes and I did try to do it with one uh, butterfly egg and it took me about four days and it was a particularly rare egg I only had three of these eggs and you you say I want to do this what's how do I do it and they say what's your protocol so I said well I, you know, <laughs> what do you mean uh, so you have to watch the protocol you go online you look at the instructions for preparing um, this particular type of egg uh, and you have to wash it and do this and that and then wash it again, and you're talking about a, a blob which you can't see, um, and you put it through filters, uh, and then you've got to get it onto this microscope, uh, and it's very, it's very complex. So actually, it takes. That's why I didn't do very much of that because you need three months just sitting on the microscope actually. Um, so I don't know, I don't know much about how they do the, the Hubble work uh, and exactly where that coloration is coming from. Uh, it's artificially part artificial. I, I don't know enough about that field. Um, it's a far, it's a very fast developing territory though. Um, In a way, your, the possibility for you to continue on the, this line of work is just vastly yeah. unlimited. I think, you know, I did a lot of, um, it's only now that I'm, I'm getting kind of uh, opportunities in the work that I was doing 10 years ago almost. So I'm going to be invited to Chile over Easter, they go and do an exhibition and speak at a big kind of festival of ideas there. So I'll do a show out there. and So it's still, you know, the mileage and the images I was producing 10 years ago still keeps coming through. Um, so finding time to do, to fit all these different things is quite, quite hard. Um, but it's fun. Um, so yeah, a question. Um, you've got the, this possibly that will always come to science and art and diverge, 
Yeah. Um, but I get the impression that you feel that they're now um, kind of converting more due to technology. What other technologies uh, that you think kind of are enabling that? So, like, digital technologies, both like manipulation technologies? Uh, sound, uh, body movement. Sensor. I mean, I think the technology is the kind of unifying thread, and there are lots of evolving technologies. So, sensory technologies, um, uh, biohacking, uh, synthetic biology. Um, there's a kind of different democratization. So, you can have biohacking clubs all over the place now that you, know, you can buy some genes and try and put this and that together. Um, so, some of them are very simple, some of them are very complex. I think the areas to do with uh, Physics uh, are much more complex than, than astronomy, but there are they have had people working out at CERN. It, it requires, you know, just as there are many kinds of science, there are many kinds of art and design practice, and you have to find the right marriage. So I informatics is another area of technology, how to translate information digitally into visual. And, so there are lots of opportunities. So one of the things I'm doing, uh, I've got a meeting week after next, the MRC, Molecular Research Council, up in, in Cambridge, where the person that I collaborated with to make that film, um, hopefully they're going to fund a student kind of residency. They're going to put the money up for that. Um, and that will, I don't know how long it will go for, two or three years maybe, uh, but that's, um, that's another opportunity. And that, trying to find out if my, my position is trying to match the right kind of student work with the right kind of opportunity. So I need to know, that's why uh, it's, been a, it's been a very steep learning curve for me to move between the craft world and everyone at the Crafts Council, and then to move to the art world, and then you know, to move to the design world. But it does mean that for a long time nobody knew where the hell to put me. And, and, and it does mean it gives you a perspective um, on each of those practices. Uh, critically, uh, you know, become harder to impress, and you can spot better work as well. Um, but I think there are other opportunities emerging. Um, there is a, a new research project for PhD students, project with funding opportunity, uh, which will place 12, I think 12 PhD students in science labs for most of their kind of program. These will be art and design students, uh, and that's coming out of Denmark and Bergen and. Uh, Goldsmiths and Lisbon, so I'm sort of slightly involved in that. So that I think there are many, many different technologies. Are there any? Is there anyone that has a science background? Okay, don't be, don't be so shy. Yeah, what was it? Um, I'm a theoretical physicist. A what theoretical? Theoretical. Do you, does it? Come into your practice? Uh, it never did actually. I was in physics for seven years and we never had any sort of coverage in like designers or artists or even really public engagement with what does, does it come into your practice now then? Can you use what you, your knowledge? Um, I do maths. Okay. But not the science anymore. We have a couple of uh, people uh, do a kind of one week maths session at, at Central St. Martin's. Um, talking about mathematical problems with anyone who wants to talk to them. Um, so, you know, it could be systems, it could be... Uh, so th I think there is lots of uh, practices emerging. Um, there's a, a group, I'm not sure if I'm part of it or not, there's a, a, a group called LASER, and it's run by Heather Barnett, who teaches on the MA Art and Science at Central St. Martins, and she also is based at Westminster. Um, and they do two two events a term, one in Westminster, one at St. St. Martins. I mean, it's very, very kind of informal, uh, two or three people talking about what they do. Could be scientists, could be artists, some high level, some low level, and it's a kind of social event. Um, there's, a, there's a huge amount going on all of a sudden. It's quite hard to keep up with. Um, 